Hey, this is Christian's Wake Up, and today we're going to dive into a subject called Understanding Catholicism. Understanding Catholicism. This is an important message because coming out of the church world, most of us didn't even know that we were in Catholicism, thinking that we were in the Church of the Most High, thinking that everything that we did was uh, righteous, but we have to understand what Catholicism really is and understand um, how we were a part of it and how we need to flee that religion. So what we want to do is we want to get an understanding. Remember, the scripture says, with all thine getting, get an understanding. Also, and I don't have to go to this scripture, but we, we read it once in a while in these lessons. We'll start off with, it is the or the most high conceal the thing. He said it's the, his glory to conceal a thing, but a king searches out a matter. Well, we're going to be kings and queens and search this matter uh, search this matter out about Catholicism and understand exactly what it is and know exactly why we should not be a part of it. So let's dive right into it. What we're going to do is we're going to start with a Google search on what the definition of Catholicism is. And I already have it pulled up, so let's go there right now. So here we have Catholicism, and this is what the definition means. It says the faith, patience, and church order. Listen, once again, the faith, patience, or excuse me, practice. I keep saying the word patience. The faith, practice, and church order of the Roman Catholic Church. The faith, practice, and church order of the Roman Catholic Church. Underneath it says, adherence to the forms of Christian doctrine. I'm pausing there because I want you to look at the words adherence to the forms of Christian doctrine and practice, which are generally regarded as Catholic rather than Protestant or Eastern Orthodox. Now, what we're going to dive into just by looking at this is it says adherence to the forms of Christian doctrine. Now, we know and we've done lessons on doctrines. Uh, at the time of this recording, what we just had passed was Christmas. Well, we know that Christmas is a Christian doctrine created through Constantine and ordained and implemented by the Roman Catholic Church. During this time, remember, it was called Yuletide before by the Germans. And actually, even before then, it was called Saturnalia. It was a pagan holiday that they wanted to keep, but the Catholic Church wanted to get the Germans into the church. So they changed it a little bit and called it Christmas or Christ Mass, the Mass or the Death of Christ. See, that is a doctrine. It is not scriptural. It's something that is part of Catholicism. That's why we're doing the subject calling understanding Catholicism, because we need to understand that they are what we call Christians, and they are the ones who form the doctrines for Christians all over this world, especially in the Western Hemisphere, and especially during this time where Christians think that their doctrine is the true doctrine, where we're going to find out about this right here during this time. So we did the Google search on Catholicism, but I want to do another search. So we're going to do a search on Holy See, and not Holy See as in S-E-A, but S-E-E. -E. Most people don't know about this. Let's read what the Holy See is, because we're learning about, once again, Catholicism and understanding it. The Holy See, look at this right here. Uh, let me scroll. Okay, yeah, right here. 
Holy See, church jurisdiction. So you can see the pictures and you see where the pictures are pointing to the Vatican right there. So that's the Vatican. I have been there. I have stood, If uh, look at picture number two, three and four over there. I have stood right in that platform when I went over to Europe. So I have been at this place. Below it says the Holy See, which is S-E-E, also called the See of Rome or Apostolic See, is the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome known as the Pope. So we see now we got the Pope involved in this right here. And then it says, which includes the apostolic Episcopal See of the Diocese of Rome with universal. And then it goes to the WikiLeak. But we're going to even look at that right there. Let's actually go to it. I'm just scrolling down, see if there's anything else I wanted to see. Okay. Yeah. No, let's go to the WikiLeak. Let's do that. Actually, before we even go to that wiki link, let me go back for one second to Catholicism. Yeah, because there was something that I, I wanted to see. Yep, right here. I know it was missing something right here. So it shows in uh, underneath when we went to the first definition of Catholicism. Right here it says Catholicism is the traditions and beliefs of the Catholic Church, which we had just read. It refers to their theology. This is what I want to, to get to. That's why I want to go back to that first definition. It refers to their theology, liturgy, morals, and spirituality. The term usually refers to churches. Here's where I was trying to get to. Both Western and Eastern. See, Europe is over in the eastern side of this world, while in the western side of this world, in America, we have Christianity. But what most Christians don't realize is, is they're part of this Catholic church, even though they say, oh, we're not Catholic. We're not, we don't believe what the Catholics believe. It's amazing that they say they don't believe what they believe, but they celebrate every holiday that they celebrate. And have instituted. And they also keep their Sabbath, which is Sunday worship or what they call the day of the Lord. OK, I just want to go back and show that real quick because I missed out on this part. I wanted to read that. Let's go back over to the Holy See. And we're going to click on the wiki link for this one. And we're going to Read this right here, the Holy See. Let's read this whole part. It says the Holy See, which is Latin, Sanca Saits, Ecclesiastical Latin. And it says Sanca Saits, Italian, Santa Saits, or Santa, Santa Said, also called the See of Rome or Apostolic See, is the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome known as the Pope, which includes the Apostolic Episcopal See, of the diocese of Rome with universal, that's where we get the word, universal ecclesiastical jurisdiction of the worldwide Catholic Church, as well as a sovereignty entity, listen, as well as a sovereign entity of international law governing the Vatican City. So this Vatican City uh, city is under international law. We're about to find out what this international law is. Let's click on that. Right here, international law. It says international law, also known as public international law and law of the nations or law of nations. See, this is where we get the law of the nations. Look what it says, is the set of rules norms and standards generally recognized as binding between nations. This is where we get where the nations have come up with their, uh, how, how do you call it? The European Union. They've come up with laws for the land. Let's get to reading. It says it establishes normative guidelines and a common conceptual framework for states across a broad range of domains including war, 
Once again, including war, diplomacy, trade, and human rights. So the Vatican City, once again, let's just get to reading. And human rights. International law aims to promote the practice of stable, consistent, and organized international relations. So we saw right here again, it says it's uh, across a broad range of domains, including war, diplomacy, trade, and human rights. So if we go back right here, what does it say? It says that the Catholic Church, as well as a sovereign entity of international law governing the Vatican City. This is where we get the Vatican having their hand in what again? Let's go back in war. Right here, I'm, I'm right in this area, including war. Now, we know about the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition, where they made war with the people of the Most High called the Jews, which is, is normally called the Jews of this day and age. We know who the true people are. We're not going to even go through that. But we also know about, uh, what is it called? The um, Knights Templars. Who were they uh, instituted by? Who, who were they set by? Who gave them their order? The Roman Catholic Church. What did the Knights Templars do? They went out and made war with anyone who did not conform to their spirituality. Once again, they made war with anyone who did not conform to their spirituality. Now, it's funny because the Most High is a God of choice. He's one who gives you a choice to do good or to do bad. What the Romans did was force people to go according to their rules, their regulations, the way that they wanted them to worship, which is taking away free choice, which is what the Most High gave in the beginning, a choice to choose right or wrong. That's why it says in uh, Deuteronomy, it says, uh, death and life are in the power of the tongue and he who loves it will eat the fruit thereof. So if you love life, you'll do what's right and speak what's right. If you love death, you'll do what's wrong and speak what's wrong, but it's your choice. So during this, uh, with this international law, what they did was, is they took the choice away and instituted Catholicism, which is why we're learning about it right now. Now, here's what I want to do. Let's go back. And I want to show you actually before we even do that, because we just got through talking about human rights and talking about the institution, which I'm going to go back here again and start here of what the Vatican has enforced or the Holy Roman Catholic Church, as they call themselves, including war, diplomacy, trade and human rights, that they are the ones who set up this system of international law. We're going to go to a scripture that's found in Revelations 13. Let's go over here now. Right here. Revelations 13, uh, verse 1. Look what it says. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And this is what John, Apostle John, saw. And he saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his head, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. That word seat and his throne. Now we're going to find out about that throne too in a second. Verse three says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded unto death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered. They were they were marveled. They marveled after the beast. Verse four says, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, this is going to play into a future uh, lesson because 
This prophecy is only known in part. There are more scriptures that are going to play in this verse four and actually in chapter, just Revelation chapter 13, but we're not going to talk about that right now, but let's go to verse five. It says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Speaking great things and blasphemies. Who has spoken great things and blasphemy against the most high? The church called the Catholic church under the rules of Catholicism. They're the ones who spoke great things. So it says once again, verse five, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. Now, if you haven't seen it, go look at my lesson called blaspheming his name, blaspheming his name. I'll put it up on the screen, actually, so you can see the image blaspheming his name, because you're going to find out that it's not blaspheming just the name, the, the name that uh, the father has, which no man really knows. But blasphemy and blaspheming his name was actually blaspheming what he said to do, but using his name, but not doing his works. That that was the true essence of blaspheming his name. Once again, watch that message. All right, let's go back to the screen. Verse seven says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now we did a whole lesson on who the saints was. It was Israel. So he made war with Israel. Once again, who did the Roman Catholic Church make war with? The Portuguese and Spanish Inquisition. Just go through my lessons or go, go look it up yourself and look who they were. It was Israel that they made war with. And then they shipped them off to Sierra Leone. Then they shipped them off to America through ships, slave ships. Once again, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him or power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Let me scroll back over one second. So that was Revelation 7. What was international law? So international law, also known as public international law and law of nations. Who did they say head up the law of the nations? Vatican City. Right here. Let's go back right here, as well as, let me just highlight this whole part, as well as a sovereign entity of international law governing the Vatican City. Going back right to the scripture over here, verse uh, seven, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints, Israel, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, those are tribes over all the tribes that the most high made and tongues. Those are the way that you speak or what language you speak languages and nations. Verse eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So he's saying, understand, if you can understand this next thing that I'm about to tell you, you got an understanding of who this is. Verse 10 says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the faith or the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, if you look back through the history books or even uh, some of the lessons that I've done that show through history, who did Christopher Columbus confide with when he came over to Africa 
to get the um, people or actually, I'm sorry, excuse me. When he came over to America, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself when he came over to America. I'm getting ahead of myself on that. When he came over to America and he said he saw a sea of black people and they confided with each other and he came over here and took over the land, which we call the Indians lands or the uh, aboriginals. Did he come over here and, and say, hey, you guys are cool and we're not going to do anything to you. Hey, let's all have Thanksgiving together and eat together and, and live in peace. No, that's not what happened. They came over. They created war with them. They took them captives. They killed their women. They killed their children. They killed their men. And the other ones they made captive. Once they had came over here, they realized that they were lazy, that they didn't want to till the land. They, they didn't want to do all that. So then we get to Africa. That's why I said, hold on, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Then they went to Africa to the coast of the slave coast, which is in Sierra Leone, where there was a tribe there called the Kingdom of Judah. This, was, this is where if you look at the old maps, right in Sierra Leone, right in the slave coast, there was a nation called the Kingdom of Judah. They went over there. They sold booze for, for, for boys and alcohol, and they brought them over to America and put them to work in the fields, and they became slaves in their houses. So when we read verse 10 that says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints, because this is all about the saints. It's talking about the saints. And verse nine says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. So it was the Catholic church who did these things and sent men over to capture, to imprison, to kill all in the name of the Lord, whom they call the Lord, not the one that not the true God of heaven whom they call the Lord. That's the reason why on our license plate, it says in God, we trust, but it's not the, it's not the God of heaven that they're talking about. They trust in their God, the same God as this next man that we're going to be talking about, who also has to do with Catholicism because we're, this message is understanding Catholicism. So let's go back over here. And we're going to learn about this one thing that I don't know if I've ever talked about before. The Edith of Milan. You're like, what is that? Well, we're about to find out right now. The Edict of Milan. Right here. The Edith of Milan. And actually, before we get, ah, you know what? Before I even do that, let's do this. Let's look up the definition of edict because most people don't know what that is. Edith definition. So you can understand what the word edict means. This is what the word edict means. Edith is an official order or, or a proclamation issued by a person in authority. So it's an order or a proclamation issued by a person in authority. Uh, you see similar below in green. It says decree. It's an order. A command, commandment. I like that word commandment. Yeah, it's a commandment, kind of how the Most High had his commandments. So here we have the Romans creating their own edict or commandment. Let's remember that word commandment. I like decree ordering, but I like that commandment because this is what they tried to do or, or did. They they think that it's, it's eternal, but it's not. So we're going to find out more about it. Let's go back to the Edict of Milan and read about it right here. Let's click on, on the Edict right here and let's get started right here. So it says the Edict of Milan or the Commandment of Milan. And I'm going to skip down and I'm going to go right here. So the Edict of Milan was the February 313 CE Agreement to treat Christians benevolently. So this sounds great. Hey, they're treating Christians 
wonderful. Uh, it's a catch to this. So let's get through listening. It says to treat Christians benevolently within the Roman Empire. Western Roman Emperor Constantine the first. Wow. We always keep hearing about this Constantine guy. You know about this Constantine that we keep hearing about all this time. So Constantine the first and Emperor Lysanias, let's see, Lys yeah, Lysanias, who controlled the Balkans and met in uh, Medio Lanon, modern day Milan. So it's called Milan. And among other things, agreed to change policies toward Christians following the Edith of Tortel uh, Toleration, excuse me, following the Edith of Toleration or the Commandment of Toleration. Let's find out about this first. So we're going to do we're going to do some reading here today. So the Edith of Toleration, we need to understand this reading of Toleration or Edith of Toleration, which is called the Edith of Serdica. So right here it says the Edith or the Commandment of Serdica, also called the Edith of Toleration by uh, Galerius, was issued in 311 in Serdica, which is now Sophia, Bulgaria, by Roman Emperor uh, Galerius. It officially ended the Diocletian or Diocletianic persecution of Christianity in the Eastern Roman Empire. So during this time, the Christians were being persecuted. The ones who actually wanted to do what was right. The ones who were following the righteous way and following the teachings of Hamashiach, they were being persecuted. So during this edict. So then we read right here below, it says the edict implicitly granted Christianis, uh, Christ, excuse me, Christianity the status of religio licita. So I'll get to reading then. It says uh, religio licita, a worship that was recognized and accepted by the Roman Empire. So let's read about this religio licita. Let's click on that. Religio licita. Look, it says permitted religion, also translated as approved religion, is a phrase used in Apollo, uh, let's see, apologeticum of Tertullian. And it was to describe the special status of the Jews in the Roman Empire. Because most people don't realize, remember during the days of Yeshua or Yahushua, Yahawashai, during his days, people keep forgetting that it was under Roman authority. King Herod, King Herod was placed there by Caesar, the, Ro uh, the Roman emperor. That's why the Savior said, who's superscription? Uh, superscription is this right here. And they said, it's Caesar. And he said, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and render unto Yahweh what belongs to Yahweh. Is because they were under the Romans. So once again, it says, um, also translated as approved religion is a phrase used in the apologeticum of Tertullian to describe the special status of the Jews in the Roman Empire. It was not an official term in Roman law. So before there was this Roman law, it was not a special term. So now I want to go back. To, uh, let's see, let me go back to uh, the Edith of Milan. So that now that we know that, one more, Edith of Milan. So we'll pick back up um, right here that they agreed, oh, wrong one, right here. That they agreed to change the policies toward Christians following the Edith of Toleration issued by Emperor Galerius two years earlier in Serdica. The Edith of Milan gave Christianity the legal status and the and a reprieve from persecution, but did not make it the state church of the Roman Empire. That occurred in AD 380 in the Edith of Thessalonica. Now remember, Edith means commandment. So the commandment of Thessalonica. Listen what this says right here. The Edith of Thessalonica. 
It says the Edith of Thessalonica, also known as Contos Populus, issued on 27 February AD 380 by three reigning Roman emperors, made the Catholicism. Catholicism. I say Catholicism. That's where we are headed right now to Catholicism. So once again, what was Catholicism? And we'll click on it. The word Catholic derived via Latin or late Latin from the Greek comes from the Greek phrase. And I'm not, I don't know how to say that on the whole, according to whole in general is a combination of Greek words. So the first use of Catholic right here was by the church father, St. Ignatius of Antioch in his letter to the uh, Smyrnians. In, con in the context of Christian ecclesiality, it has a rich history and several uses. So here's what Catholic faith means. The word in English can mean either of the Catholic faith or relating to the historic doctrine and practice of the Western church. Catholicos, the title used for the head of some churches in Eastern Christian tradition. Once again, Eastern Christian tradition is derived from the same linguistic origin. So they're telling you that it came from a Eastern Christian tradition, the tradition of the Romans, which is the word universal. This is a universal and it'll say right here. Actually, I can just scroll right here. In non-ecclesia, uh, I'm going to read this right here. In non-ecclesiastical use, it derives its English meaning directly from its roots and is currently used to mean the following. Including a wide variety of things or all embracing. All embracing. What is going on right now in Catholicism? They are bringing all the religions together. Uh, that's what the Pope, Pope Francis is doing, uniting all religions because it's all embracing. Universal or of general interest. Having broad interest or wide sympathies. Inclusive. Inviting. The term has been incorporated into the name of the largest Christian communion, the Roman Catholic Church. We don't even need to go any further than that right there. So universal. So understanding Catholicism is understanding what universal is, understanding that they have created a universal church. Okay. So what I want to do is because this is talking about the universal church, what I want to do is I want to show you something that was written in the Book of Mormon about this universal church that they knew and it was part of a prophecy by Nephi. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to first Nephi chapter 13. I'm just going to scroll over here and show you what it says. Let's go here now. Right here, chapter 13. Look at what it says. And I'll read the title, chapter 13. Nephi sees in visions or envision the church of the devil set up among the Gentile. That's I just want to concentrate on that part right there. The church of the devil set up on by the Gentiles or among the Gentiles. Verse one says, and the angel or and it came to pass that the angel spake unto me saying, look. And I looked and beheld many nations and kingdoms. And the angel said unto me, what beholdest thou? And I said, I behold many nations and kingdoms. And he said unto me, these are the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles. And it came to pass that I saw among the Gentiles or the nations of the Gentiles, the formation of a great church. So this is a... a prophecy or vision that Nephi saw. But let's look at the description of what the great church was. Verse five right here. 
it says, and the angel said unto me, behold, the formation of a church, which is most abominable above all other churches, which slay, once again, listen to this, which slayeth the saints of God. See, there is no other church that can boast or brag about slaying the saints of God, except the Catholic church. They are the ones who slay the saints of God, which slayeth the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them and bindeth them down and yoketh them with a yoke of iron and bringeth them into captivity. Now, y'all know about the whole yoke of iron. Just look at just look at the American slavery and look what was around their necks. Yokes of iron. When they put them on slave ships, yokes of iron. And bringeth them down into captivity. See, we didn't walk into captivity. We were brought to captivity. Verse six says, and it came to pass that I beheld this great and abominable church. And I saw the devil that he was the founder of it. So the Catholic church under the Roman system, under the Roman empire was not started by the God of heaven. It was not started by the God of the saints. It was started by their God, the devil. Now they won't say that their God is the devil. They'll say their God is the most high, but now we know who their God is because the formation of this great church, there can only be one true church. There can't be two true churches. Only one church can be true. And that's the church of the most high. So if anybody comes and changes his rules, his regulations, the way that things are run, those who kill, those who lead into captivity, but call themselves the true church of the most high, we know that they are the liars. Verse six again says, and it came to pass that I beheld this great and abominable church and I saw the devil that he was the founder of it. Verse seven, and I also saw gold and silver and silks and scarlets and fine twine linen and all matter of precious clothing. And I saw many harlots. Remember that it said out of the mother of harlots came her children. That's your offsprings. That's your offsprings of religion. That's where you get your Pentecostal. That's where you get your um, Orthodox. That's where you get your Baptist because they all came from one mother. They all came from Catholicism. They all came from the Catholic Church. Look at the history of when the Pentecostal movement happened, that they broke away from the church. Those are branches, many harlots. Verse eight says, and the angel spake unto me saying, behold, the gold and the silver and the silks and the scarlets and the fine twine linen and the precious clothing and the harlots are the desires of this great and abominable church. Show me right now in this world what church has all of these things that is dressed in gold, silver silks, scarlets, fine twine linen, and precious clothing, and harlots, and desires of this great church or great and abominable church. These are their desires. We know what church that is. And last verse right here, it says, and also for the praise of the world, do they destroy the saints of God and bring them down into captivity? Because the saints, remember, were on top. Well, it says for the praise of the world, in order to have the praise of the world, you have to get rid of the saints of the most high and you have to self set yourself up above them. So what did they do? They brought them into captivity. They brought them low so they can lift themselves up. Understanding Catholicism. I want to leave you with this last um scripture, set of scripture, because this also talks about what Nephi saw and it shows his interpretation. It's another book they, once again, they've been trying to keep away from us. It's in the sealed portion. So we're going to go to this set of scriptures. It's found in the sealed portion, 
chapter 14, verse 28. Let's go there now. All right, we're here in um, the sealed portion, chapter 14. We're starting at verse 28. Let's look at what it says here. Now, this is what was meant by the prophecy of Nephi. So we just got the reading in the Book of Mormon in 1 Nephi 13. In the sealed portion, this talks about the translation of this prophecy. It says, now, this is what was meant by the prophecy of Nephi, wherein he saw a vision of the latter days. And Nephi wrote, saying, and it came to pass that when the angel had spoken these words, he said unto me, Rememberest thou the covenants of the father unto the house of Israel. So I just want to keep showing people when he says the saints, he's not talking about Christians. He's in fact talking about the covenant, like it says right here, of the father unto the house of Israel. Israel is the key point into this prophecy. If you don't understand that Israel are the saints, then it's going to be hard to understand this entire prophecy. So you have to understand that first. And once again, th these are not my words. I didn't, I didn't come up not Israel. And I'm not even coming with that, but we still have to understand what the father says when it comes to the scriptures. We still have to have an understanding because just because you don't like the facts, and I'm, I'm talking to Gentiles now, because some Gentiles don't like, well, it's, it's Israel, and we and you keep saying who the true people are. If you don't like that fact, you're going to have a big problem when he comes back. If you don't accept that fact, I can't help you. And you can just go ahead and go find a different channel, watch somebody else who's going to lie to you and tell you that Israel is a whole different group of people, and y'all know who they say they are. But what good is that going to do you during the day of judgment? I'm only here to tell the truth. And I'm not here to throw stuff in your face. I'm here as your fellow brother, as your fellow worker in, in Hamashiach to tell the truth. This is what the prophecy says. I'm going to read it. It says, rememberest thou the covenants of the father unto the house of Israel. I said unto him, yea. Verse 29 says, and it came to pass that he said unto me, look and behold that great and abominable church, which is the mother of abominations. So she's the mother of abominations whose founder is the devil. So we have two witnesses. Now we have two witnesses saying the exact uh, same exact thing who tells who's the founder of the church. And it is the devil. Verse 30. And he said unto me, behold, there are saved two churches only. See, even though there's many uh, branches of the churches, all those branches come from one church. So it says right here, behold, there are saved two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. Therefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great church. And you might say, I'm not with no, I'm not. If you do the rules of Catholicism, that's why we're saying, that's why this lesson is called understanding Catholicism. If you obey her, what was, what was the Edith? Commandments. If you obey her commandments, like Sunday worship, like Christmas, like Easter, like Thanksgiving, even though Thanksgiving was a American holiday, but it was still instituted by the church because they control what goes on the calendar. So anytime you obey her laws, the uh, Thanksgiving, <laughs> actually, I'm just bringing it up uh, Halloween. Those are all her laws. If you obey her laws, if you obey her commandments, if you obey her holidays, you belong to that church, even though you're not a Catholic. Uh, once again, it says, therefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. She is that great whore that the Bible talks about. Verse 31, 
And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth. And she sat upon many waters. Now that word waters is not waters that we all think that we're just talking about the liquid that's in the, the sea. No, it's talking about the other holy sea, the S-E-E. -E. That's the reason why we went over what that holy S-E-E -E is. Nations, tribes, languages. That's the holy sea that it's talking about. It made sure that it made a differential of it. The, see, the, the holy sea, the all-seeing eye, that's the holy church, the holy sea. They are the all seen eye. Verse 31. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth. And she sat upon many waters and she had dominion over all the earth. Among all nations, kindreds, tongues and people. Show me any other church. Just just show it to me. If, if you want to prove this wrong, show me any other church whose leader is like the Pope. Show it to me. Show me any other church whose leader can go into any nation, any kindreds, any tongues, and any people and bring messages and they have to allow him to come. Show me any place that can deny the Pope. Just, just prove it. Show any place where the Pope cannot go. I mean, this dude can go anywhere to any nation. Uh, who is it? Jim, Jim Kung, Jim Hung in North Korea. He can go there. He can go anywhere he desires because he has dominion over all the earth. His church has dominion over all the earth among all nations, kindreds, tongues and people. Verse 32. And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God and its numbers were few. We are few out here. The church of the Lamb of God. It says because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb who were the saints of God. Once again, the church of the Lamb are the saints of God. Now, don't get riled up Gentiles because I've already done the lessons that show that Gentiles can be grafted in, not only grafted in. Remember, the Savior himself said other sheep that's not of this fold, I must add to the fold. So always take that. Don't let no Hebrew Israelite tell you, oh, let's see what it says, right? Don't let nobody tell you that because he said he's going to gather others from the fold. So you hold on to that truth that you will be gathered from the fold from other. You'll be from the other folds gathered to his fold and be among the saints, just like it was in the days of Moses. Mo Remember, strangers were at it in, in the days of Moses. And he said they could live in the holy mountain if they obeyed him. Let's not forget about Rahab, who was not an Israelite. Uh, you, you Hebrew Israelites, let's not forget that she was added to the Israelites and that she had children who were among the Israelites who became part of their tribe. So once again, I just I always want to make sure I tell the Gentiles because teaching these lessons, when you hear this stuff, when you hear who were the saints of God, you know for a fact that the saints of God are the children of Israel, then a lot, some people lose hope, and especially if the person who's teaching does not clarify that the Gentiles can also be added on. That's what the, the Savior himself said. That. So I just wanted to touch on that before we uh, get done. So once again, it says, who were the saints of God were also upon all the face of the earth and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great whore. Whom I saw. All right. Verse 33. And now I, Moroni, ask if you believe that, and I'm going to scroll over, if you believe that there are more than two churches only, I say unto you that according to the words of Nephi, and I know that his words are true, there are saved but two churches only. Now, please don't get, 
Well, in Revelations uh, chapter two and three, there's seven churches. Look at what look, look at look at what it says about those seven churches. There was really only two. It's seven churches there. He's talking to seven churches, but it's, it's only two. Um, what is it called? Two um, scenarios. Six of them churches was going to hell, and he said they was going to be punished. Only one of them churches, if you look at it, he said was was going to. Uh, it was Philadelphia who was going to not be in that temptation. The other ones were all, all them churches was going to all experience the temptation, the last trials that was going to happen on this world. Two scenarios. So it's only two churches, even though there's seven mentioned in Revelations. When there's only two scenarios, it's only two churches. But there are seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3, but there's really only two. I hope that you understand what it's saying in that scenario because it's not one church going here one church going there one church going here one church going there they were all being punished except for philadelphia so verse 34 behold if you do not belong to the church and this explains it right here if you do not belong to the church of the lamb of god or in other words if ye do not believe in his gospel of his son which is the lamb of god and keep his commandments. Actually, I'm just going to go over there just so I can. I'm going to go right to the church of Philadelphia to show you why there's two churches. Let me go right over here. Uh, Revelation. Actually, I'm here. Revelation 3, 9. Philadelphia. Look at what he says. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for thou hast little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. Two things. He kept my word, his commandments and has not denied my name. Go back over here. What does it say? Verse 34. Behold, if you do not belong to the church of the Lamb of God or in other words, if you do not believe in his gospel of his son, which is the Lamb of God, his name. And then it says, and keep his commandments, which he have given unto you by the words of his own mouth in his gospel. His word matches line upon line, precept upon precept. Then it says below, it says, then ye belong to the great and abominable church that Nephi saw in his vision. Verse 35. We're going to end right here. And the words of Nephi are not intended to mean that there is any one church that is the church of the Lamb of God. I did all that explaining for nothing. It shows right here that there's more than one church, but there's only really two churches. Okay. So right here, once again, and the words of Nephi are not intended to mean that there is any one church that is the church of the Lamb of God or that any one church is the church of the devil. But his intent was that ye either believe in the words of the Lamb of God and keep his commandments, or ye follow the works of the world, which are the works of the devil. So, understanding Catholicism, what we have learned from here is we have learned that the Roman Catholic Church instituted Catholicism, this universal church where they all run by, but see the rules that they run by are the rules that they have set up. Not the rules of the most high. So when they say universal, they're talking about their universal rules, not his universal, not the most high's universal rules. So understanding Catholicism, if you're going to stay in this Catholic way, and I'm not just talking about the Catholic Church now, I'm talking about all the branches, all the, the harlots of the Catholic Church, all the, the legs that came out of it, the Protestant, the, the Baptist, the Kojic, all, all the branches that came out of it, the non-denominationals that still keep their rules and regulations. If you're going to stay in it, understand what it really means, understand who the founder of that church really is. That's all I'm trying to say is that you need to understand Catholicism because understanding it will help you to either make the, once again, I'm not, I'm not going to try to sway anybody 
People have to make their own decisions. This is not about swaying. This is about telling the truth. And it says the truth will make you free. Is you either you're going to be free to go to hell or you're going to be free to go to heaven because you follow the lamb of the most high. I hope this message has helped you. I hope the information in this lesson uh, has helped you to gain an, a better understanding of what Catholicism really is and if you're going to stay in it or not. Hey, this is Christians Wake Up. Glad I can give you another lesson and I can't wait to the next one. And with that said, I'm out.